I want to talk today about a common clinic referral asymptomatic heavy coronary calcium. This is a case scenario. A 64-year-old diabetic man with no known CAD is incidentally found to have heavy amount of coronary calcium on a chest CT done when he had pneumonia. The calcium is particularly heavy in the LAD. He is not very active and is limited by hip pain, but he does not report any exertional chest pain on his activity or any lifestyle limiting dyspnea. What is the best management strategy for this heavy calcium detected on CT? Statin and risk factor control? Or on top of that, you need to do coronary CTA, stress testing, or coronary angiography? And the answer here is actually A. A high calcium score, more than 400 or even more than 1,000 in an asymptomatic patient does not dictate coronary angiography or CTA stress testing. The same applies to severe coronary calcium incidentally found on a non-dedicated chest CT. And there are four reasons for that in my opinion, and I will dissect each one. So the first one is the calcium score strongly predicts coronary events, but is less strongly predictive of obstructive CAD. It does predict obstructive CAD, but less strongly. You get better prediction of obstructive CAD when you combine calcium score with the clinical features. Depending on symptoms, 30 to 70% of patients with high calcium score over 400 or even over 1,000 have obstructive CAD. And this is one important CTA analysis of asymptomatic patient. It's a Swedish registry. And less than 1% of patients with calcium score of zero have obstructive CAD. 7% of those with calcium score of 11 to 100 have obstructive CAD. 24% for those with a score of 100 to 400. And 30 to 45% for those asymptomatic patients with a score over 400 have obstructive CAD. Now, those numbers are higher in symptomatic patients with typical angina and a higher pretest likelihood. Up to 3% of young patients and 6% of older patients with calcium score of zero have obstructive CAD, non-calcified obstructive CAD, usually and overwhelmingly of one vessel only. It's not three vessel or left main disease. And 42% of those with calcium score over 400 and 50 to 70% of those with calcium score over 1,000 have obstructive CAD. And this is a study by a Danish registry, Winter, in a symptomatic patient uh, that shows you the distribution of obstructive CAD. Even when you have a calcium score very high, over a thousand, the probability is in that 50 to 70% range. This is another study of a symptomatic patient. Again, higher calcium score in symptomatic patient do predict a higher probability of obstructive CAD. In this study, uh, over 60 to 70%. Which brings me to that second idea. Obstructive CAD is better predicted by the combination of exertional chest pain with high calcium score. This is an extremely important Danish study by Dr. Winter showing that using the traditional clinical features of typical angina and age, sex, and risk factors, the old clinical prediction models such as Forrester are mediocre at predicting CAD and you can barely reach a pretest probability of 50% even with typical exertional angina in an older man with risk factors. Conversely, your pretest probability of CAD may be improved by combining clinical feature with a calcium score in which case you can get a pretest likelihood approaching 60, 70% or even 80%. If your pretest clinical likelihood is under 30%, but you have high calcium score over 400 or over 1,000, then you can get a pretest CAD likelihood of over 50% and even over 60, 70%. 
And this has been incorporated in the ACC chest pain guideline, wherein you add to the clinical prediction model of typical angina and age risk factors, calcium score. And this is again from the winter trial, it shows you that the higher you go up on your calcium score, the more dramatically your pretest probability of CAD goes up, particularly when you're over 400 or especially over 1,000 on your calcium score. And that increases the pretest likelihood much more than traditional risk factors. Again, this is another study, and it shows that the high calcium score along with typical angina is predictive of CAD with a likelihood of potentially over 50 to 70%. The third and very important idea is that calcium score is a powerful predictor of coronary events regardless of the presence of obstructive CAD. Hence, seeking obstructive CAD does not dramatically alter prognosis and management. Calcium score is independently and more powerfully predictor of coronary event than obstructive CAD by itself. And even if obstructive CAD is present, a calcium score of zero still predicts a very low cardiac event rate of less than 1% per year. Conversely, even if you don't have obstructive CAD, a high calcium score over 400 is as predictive of future MI as a prior coronary event, more than 3% per year, and may qualify for secondary prevention measures. And this is a landmark Danish registry analysis that shows that what it independently predicts mortality is calcium score. There is an association between calcium score and obstructive CAD. The higher your calcium score, as I showed, the higher your obstructive CAD. But it's calcium score that independently predicts MACE and mortality. The higher your calcium score, you see between those graphs, the higher the mortality and the MACE. But for the same calcium score, within the same category of calcium score, the presence or absence of obstructive CAD did not affect mortality and outcomes independently. It is the calcium score that predicts mortality independently. It's the amount of plaque burden that predicts mortality independently. And keep that idea in mind, the key idea in stable CAD. Coronary stenosis determines angina more than MI death. Revascularization of stenosis reduces angina, not MI death. Coronary stenosis is assessed by CTA or stress testing or coronary angiography. Conversely, it's a plaque burden and calcium score that determines MI and death regardless of stenosis and its severity. This plaque burden calcium score is not modifiable by revascularization and is assessed by calcium score CT or by CTA. This plaque burden has a moderate correlation with the presence of obstructive CAD, yet regardless of obstructive CAD, the risk of MI is high and may be underestimated by the degree of coronary obstruction. The fourth argument against coronary angiography in this patient or stress testing is that seeking and revascularizing obstructive stable CAD in asymptomatic patients has not proven beneficial except potentially for left main disease. And this is based on four trials, Ischemia, Courage, FAME2, and Barry 2 d the four landmark stable CAD revascularization trials. It is a rather risk factor control and statin that improve outcome in stable CAD. And aspirin may be considered in young patients less than 70 with low bleeding risk. And this is a scenario I see frequently. I recently saw a patient about 65 year old diabetic woman, asymptomatic, had heavy calcium on CT. So a cardiologist decided to do a stress test which showed some defects. After that, he did coronary angiogram, which showed moderate disease in the left circumflex and the RCA, which to my eyes did not appear angiographically significant. Anyway, she underwent stenting 
of those left circumflex and RCA disease. And even though she was asymptomatic at the time, eight months later, she started to have progressive severe angina from instant restenosis. So here is a patient who, because of heavy coronary calcium and mismanagement of heavy coronary calcium, doing stress test, falsely read as positive, then coronary angiogram, which was falsely exaggerated in terms of stenosis. She underwent stenting that was not appropriate, and now she's having angina and instant restenosis. Keep in mind what I always say, try to avoid stenting moderate CAD unless it's severely symptomatic. In stable CAD, the natural progression of a stenosis that is significant, 50 to 80 percent, but non-critical, is likely slower than the progression of instant processes. This suggests avoiding moderate disease PCI, even if functionally significant, unless angina is severe and refractory. And these are the numbers. Natural progression of stenosis over 50%. There is less than 10% risk of progression of the stenosis over one and a half to two years per courage trial in geographic analysis with less than two to 3% individual risk of MI from this lesion. And at least as many events or more arise from areas of non-significant disease. Now, within stent, if you stand that lesion, you have at one year 10% instant restenosis with 1% stent thrombosis and 1% to 2% stent related MI. That's higher than those numbers. And beyond one year, you have 1% to 2% severe instant tissue growth, whether neo hyperplasia or the uh, more aggressive neoatherosclerosis.